Good afternoon to all, and thank you for joining us in this um, Friday afternoon in our new Education Normal webinar series. I'm Chi Lee. I'm the Senior Research Scientist in OER, as well as the Program Director of Learning Sciences and Innovation. Um, this is a two-part panel series. Um, we want to feature the work of NIE research scientists. They will explore perspective of teaching learning in and out of classroom in their specific research area on learning sciences and technology. Okay, the panelists will share their design studies, their research with the aim of informing our evolving landscape on blended learning, one-to-one -one and home-based learning. For today, this is the first part. We will feature our three colleagues from learning sciences and innovation. Um, Kenneth will talk about the work on sorbet, socially responsible behavior through embodied thinking. Long Kai will talk about interest-driven learning, and Long Xiang will talk about seamless learning. Without much further ado, I'm going to pass the time to Kenneth to start his talk. Kenneth? Uh, thank you, Chuli. Uh, hello to everybody here. Thank you for your time today. And um, on behalf of my fellow presenters, I'm sure we're all very grateful that you've chosen to spend this afternoon with us. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and, yep, okay. So let's, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, so each of us today has been given around 15 minutes to share our work with you. And um, uh, for, for my particular portion over the next 15 minutes, um, I'll be sharing something that my team and I have been working on uh, with, with teachers and for teachers in secondary schools in Singapore um, since, the, since the beginning of the year. Um, some of you may already be familiar with um, the work for those of you who have uh, um, attended some of, uh, maybe a, one or two of my talks earlier this year, I'll try to introduce new stuff to you um, so as to keep things fresh. Okay, so um, as, as uh, Chuli has uh, introduced, the Sorbet Project, uh, the acronym stands for Socially Responsible Behavior Through Embodied Thinking, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go on. So um, this, so have, if we can think about, um, um, I, I'm not sure, well, yeah, all of us, maybe most of us, many of us may have had the experience of being stuck in an elevator. Um, this particular photograph uh, is obviously not of a stuck elevator because the doors are open. It's taken from a hospital in Thailand but, um, and, and you can see it's obviously taken uh, sometime this year because of the, the um, social distancing uh, protocols. But if you have ever been stuck in an elevator, you will know that it's not a very pleasant experience because uh, of the uncertainty of the um, feeling of being hemmed in with uh, social strangers and also uh, if there has been a power outage, then it's uh, the, the, the feeling of uh, being hemmed in is even worse. So uh, that's, so those, those, are, those are feelings and emotions that, um, that we would remember from a pre-COVID era. Um, so it, if we can just imagine how much more uh, they would be exacerbated uh, if we were ever to be stuck in a lift um, this year or subsequent to this year. Um, so the reason I'm starting with this is because 
In the context of uh, home-based learning, in the context of remote learning and blended learning, um, by definition, some of our students may be um, uh, may, be, may, may, may find themselves in situations where they are not in close contact with their peers. And as learning designers, as teachers, as curriculum designers, we know that it's going to be difficult for us to uh, find ways of engaging uh, learners who are remote from our physical location uh, with, uh, uh, concurrently with learners who are indeed co-present with us in, say, a classroom environment. Um, so one of the ways in which my team and I has been thinking about the problem is in terms of the whole literature on embodied cognition and um, uh, learning through games, play-based learning, um, which we have had a fairly long trajectory of uh, in this field, uh, working in this field since about 2007 or so. So for the past uh, 13 years, we've built up some kind of uh, trajectory in terms of understanding the affordances of embodied cognition and uh, virtual environments for giving learners a more authentic understanding and sense of presence, even should they be not physically co-located with each other. And the, um, yeah. So let's go on. So as I said, this uh, acronym um, stands for that, as you can see. And, um, and uh, as I also said in the introduction, it's a learning activity which uh, was initiated by teachers, uh, a group of teachers in March earlier this year uh, came to us to help them take their existing pedagogies online. Uh, with the imminent onset of what in Singapore is known as the circuit breaker or the lockdown. So um, we have anecdotal evidence, regardless of geography, regardless of which country we hail from, of uh, people uh, not necessarily um, um, understanding or, or respecting the protocols that have been in place globally. And here in Singapore, we also sometimes face the same problem because after a while, social distancing fatigue and COVID fatigue does tend to set in. However, um, again, anecdotal data or data does tend to, this is from CNN, uh, it does tend to uh, show the influence of um, uh, pandemic spread uh, uh, or pandemic diffusion with regards to the efficacy of um, the respective populations of countries follow uh, being able to uh, practice um, the protocols that have been recommended for us, such as the wearing of masks and uh, social distancing. And um, so I've talked about the wearing of masks, social distancing and washing hands. So these are three simple uh, behaviors. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so basically different, different education systems and different uh, federal uh, local government systems have been trying different ways of um, uh, encouraging good social behavior, socially responsible behavior, such as for example, this picture which was taken from a cafe in Germany. Um, and the next picture, which was taken from the streets of Toronto in Canada. Um, with respect to schooling in ed education, uh, this picture from a school in China shows how uh, younger children, younger learners are encouraged to try to um, um, develop the new, the new habit, uh, invest the self-discipline to develop the new habit in a fun and culturally authentic way. Um, so in Singapore, in Singapore we have uh, um, encouragements like this, um, and nevertheless, it's it's um, we feel that it's important for the students to develop authentic understanding of the reasons why 
rather than just do it because they've been told to do so. So the objective of the project, which I'm describing, I'm attempting to describe today, is basically to give learners a more grounded understanding of the need to develop the new habit of social distancing. Um, uh, the emphasis is, of course, on the words uh, more grounded understanding. Okay, so uh, uh, in terms of a conceptual framework, basically, uh, learners have embodied interactions within a virtual environment within the learn within the teachers or the learning designers, the curriculum designers control, with the hope that eventually this builds um, through uh, learning science theory informed uh, activity to the everyday interactions outside the school or uh, outside the formal classroom environment. Uh, the theoretical foundations are therefore, of course, uh, in terms of embodied cognition, as I've re repeated, and in terms of uh, Jim G's uh, work in game-based learning, and in my own work on uh, the, uh, the affordances of virtual worlds for learning. Okay, so now, so we've been told to prioritize to play uh, when schools reopen and in certain economies, uh, we have been fortunate enough to be able to reopen our schools. Um, and therefore, the environment which we've come up with is a facsimile of a, a typical Singapore neighborhood, which includes elements which the children would be familiar with, such as playgrounds and public housing estate in the background, high rise. And basically what they do is we give them um, a certain time period of the teacher's choosing, say typically about 20 minutes or so, for the learners to interact with each other within this environment in either a non-structured, semi-structured or fully structured manner, depending on their needs. And from time to time, appearing around their waists, um, uh, learners will see colored discs depending on the proximity they have with respect to each other. At the same time, uh, in the background, the system is recording the interactions uh, so that um, after the whole activity, um, the teacher and the students can have access to data from their in-world interactions through a web-based dashboard, as you can see here. So, for example, this table shows um, the... Uh, the the student uh, given the 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 pseudonym Simonastic, and who he or she interacted with over the course of the activity. Uh, likewise, here um, the level of interaction is predetermined by, or it can be retrospectively determined by the teacher and all the students, depending on whether the teacher wishes to involve the students in. Uh, the the design of uh, the, yeah the design of the activity or not. So in summary, um, the uh, sobe has two halves in terms of its um, in terms of its design. Uh, the first half being an embodied half, and the second half being a dialogic half. Um, and um, for the embodied half. There's uh, for the embodied half, the, the embodied half basically provides uh, the affordance of learner agency, meaning that the, the, the students have the f autonomy to explore environments, to interact uh, with each other as they would normally and naturally in a naturalistic setting, as opposed to just uh, following step by step a series of instructions uh, where there's limited late learner agency. Another affordance of the embodied half is the uh, is that is the visual augmentation, which I've already talked about, and um, the the embodied half is customized, uh, customizable by the teacher and all the learners together, in duration as well as in the probability of infection. The embodied half by itself would not be complete because um, uh, good learning science theory uh, um, obliges us to consider the dialogic the dialogic follow-up to the embodiment. So in the dialogic follow-up to the embodiment, uh, this is done through access to a web-based dashboard. Uh, the data is accessible uh, and scalable because uh, it's basically just uh, 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 tab-delimited data uh, and therefore can be accessed on handhelds uh, in a one-to-one -one environment, for example, or uh, handhelds and tablets in a home-based learning uh, slash home base slash 
classroom mixed blended environment. And um, it's exportable to the cloud, such as Microsoft Cloud, Google Cloud, and so on and so forth. So in summary, some possible applications of the project uh, are in terms of mathematics, uh, in terms of uh, social studies education, civics education, and citizenship. As, uh, and we also have, um, we're also exploring uh, conversations with geography teachers uh, uh, in terms of like spatial diffusion and um, science teachers in terms of epidemiology. Uh, we'd also like to reach out beyond secondary schools to primary schools if any of, uh, if any of uh, us among the audience are able to uh, and are willing to collaborate. And um, that's more or less that. Uh, so this kind of like summarizes um, the various um, modalities of the Sorbet project. Uh, this is a picture from um, a, cl uh, uh, a class which has like, been trying it out. And as you can see, this photograph is pretty current because, um, um, uh, and also importantly, there's the mix of, um, of screen interaction with pen and paper based interaction. Yep. So that brings me to the end of the project. And I'd like to thank my facilitators and my co-presenters whom you'll enjoy the benefit of hearing from soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, I just want to remind you, um, if you have questions, there is a question and answer um, button at the bottom of your screen. You can put in your question. Um, I wonder if there's any question. We can have one question to Kenneth now before we pass to the next speaker. If not, I do have one though. Kenneth, the last bit was interesting. You say that the integration into math and other subjects, and especially into math, could you say a little bit more about how it has been done? I guess the mathematical concept is also involved, right? Sure. Um, so th uh, thanks, Julie, for the question. Um, so in terms of mathematics, uh, the teachers are exploring it uh, from the topic which they call probability theory. So what they're interested in uh, by using the data is um, allowing the um, students opportunities to to plot the interaction data on a graph thereby uh, deducing the s curve in terms of cumulative frequency and um, and uh, i'm not i'm not speaking very confidently because i'm not a mathematics uh, uh, educator by training but I do know that is what they're using the, um, the, the project for. And also in terms of um, understanding basic descriptive statistics, uh, as you know, such as uh, mean, mean and median, as well as standard deviation. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank thanks, you. Thanks, there is one question that I'm gonna read out. As a broader and more general question, are there specific topics or types of subject matter that better lend itself to SOBI? Uh, or are there topics that are less suitable for SOBI? Sure. Okay. So I do know for a fact that uh, in 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 the sec in the secondary four geography curriculum in Singapore, which is uh, yeah the secondary four, so that's a uh, grade ten. Um, there is a topic currently uh, uh, health and diseases, and uh, I do have um, uh, geography teachers who are keen to explore that with me. I also have a. Um, uh, so, uh, social studies, uh, a couple of social studies teachers who would like to explore it in terms of uh, the, the, the general value or, of known as uh, uh, positive social values in citizenship education. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kenneth. That's really interesting and very timely. As Kenneth said, those who are interested to, to kind of connect with him and do more about it, please do so um, by emailing him. I will pass the time to uh, Long Kai, who will talk about interest-based driven, and then finally we'll have a panel uh, discussion together. Yeah, Long Kai, please. Okay. So, um, and it, <clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to present uh, the work of, my, of a small uh, project. So it's about interest or intro-driven learning. Uh, I don't know how many of you be, has been kind be, be, be interested 
in this kind of approach. So uh, I think in this uh, in this study, so we have done uh, this study uh, for the next about uh, about one and a half a year. So we are trying to capitalize students' personalized personal interest uh, in science learning. So that's the that's the kind of the study. I think we can maybe we can draw certain uh, kind of uh, inspirations to to coping with the current COVID-19 uh, situation. So uh, I think we can okay, get started. Okay, just let you know that your screen is not in the presentation mode, just in case, yeah. Okay, uh, it's okay? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh, we, can, we can get started with this kind of interest-driven learning approach. So I think this, uh, this approach already has a long history. And uh, it's really, we are trying to say that uh, how to make, how to, because now we are, uh, we are always talking about how to make this kind of uh, teacher-centered towards uh, student-centered way. So I think interest-driven learning is actually a very student-centered or student-centric learning approach. And uh, we also believe that if we can try to make link between the interest and the learning content and make this kind of linkage to be explicit, so then we can make the students to be engaged in active and deep learning. And uh, we also think that uh, uh, if the learners are motivated by interest, they can, be more, uh, they can be more motivated by the intrinsic reward of getting info. So uh, all this kind of uh, background is talking about how, how we can make interest as a component, as a central piece that we can that we can leverage on to design our learning environment. So I think that is still something that has been missing in the current uh, school environment because we think we, we can still see that uh, in the classroom instruction, uh, teachers, most of the teachers can, may, may, may still has a, uh, may not have such a time or effort. More ha they haven't put more uh, more attention to the to the interest of the students. So then, so then, so it means that how can we identify individual students' interests and how we can leverage it on that? So that's a I think that's a major challenge we are facing in the current uh, school school uh, schooling environment so uh, so then it means that we have to make it as an interest as a starting point for thinking and uh, and designing our pedagogical activities so that's how that I, th I think that's that's one of the uh, most challenging part for the teachers to be to be get started to design and uh, enacting with the interest-driven learning activities. Okay, and uh, here that we can see certain, definitely we can see certain uh, significance. So why, 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 uh, why, why the interest can be important? So the so we we are just uh, thinking about that. Okay, so like this uh, with strong. Emphasis on the grace on learning students, the curiosity for learning may not have been fully uh, leveraged. Or this kind of the support, the, uh, we, we, are, we are also talking about that uh, the, this kind of interest-driven learning can inspire students to engage with their uh, disciplinary, disciplinary academic uh, learning. And, uh, and uh, if the students can be, can be interested in certain, uh, certain area, so they can be more inclined, spend more time, more effort, and present long time at that kind of task. So this is just a, some kind of uh, background on the, interest, on the significance or the importance of the interest-driven learning. Okay. So then how can we do this? So we propose such a model. So the first thing is about the what. So we, act, we have to identify students' interest first, okay? 
And then the second step is how. How can we make link the student interest to the curriculum? And then the third step is about design the context. So we have this kind of uh, uh, the three major uh, steps. Uh, because they actually, if we can see that, uh, uh, so we, we can try to connect data by just to put up a questionnaire because we, we, we know that uh, the students have, have been involved in those programs, in, in their hobbies, in their CCAs, even in their ALPs. So what kind of activities they have spent most of the, the time so this kind of questionnaire can be a source of identifying students' personal interest. And then we need to evaluate how best create opportunities and relevance to student interest, and then try to, try to design a certain kind of activities, learning activities that can be adaptive to be the student's uh, interest. And, uh, and then we do the implementation, and then we link the context with the student's interest, and then we make this kind of link very explicit in the lessons. Okay, so we have to do this with a uh, with with a local school. Uh, so for this this lesson, we can see that so this, the this kind of scenario or not a scenario, this kind of justification. For the study is like, oh, students always find the lesson, science lesson to be boring because they can, cannot find the, the relevance. So they may find this kind of science concepts to be, to be very abstract. They may be find also the curriculum to be quite oriented to the examinations and the content is not engaging. So, uh, so this kind of, so how to motivate, how to motivate them and how to support the interest is a, is a major challenge that we are facing when you are teaching in science as well as, well as in, in math, okay? And then, uh, so, so this one is, is, so this kind of less linkage between interest and content, a more serious, uh, serious uh, uh, kind of consequence is that they may be, they may be still lacking a real interest in science, and they may be lacking a, a major passion for the pursuit of career in science. So that's a, some of consequences that we are, we may be facing. Okay, so here we, we have designed a questionnaire to ascertain the student interest. So we are based on this kind of uh, inventory. And then we designed a lesson that can introduce science concepts that are linked to the interest groups. And then all the, all the design tasks are linked to the interest with the formal content and all the resources are co have been co-designed with the researchers and the teachers. And we also connect data on the, this kind of, uh, so during the lesson, uh, we, we have the teacher can supplement with a more uh, example specific to the interest uh, groups, right? And we also have a progress checker questions to check the, the understanding as some kind of informal assessment. We also have those uh, challenging tasks for the students to work on at the end of each semester to showcase or to, to solidate uh, the, uh, the understanding. So this kind of activities we have done. And then we have two lessons. We have one control lesson. Well, we have one uh, experiment lesson. We have this kind of descriptive mixed method case study approach. We have uh, pre-survey and post-survey and pre-test and post-test. We also have those uh, focus group interviews and the field of notes, okay? So actually here we can see that we have about five groups. So uh, according to this uh, survey, we have the performing arts, arts, sports, games, and nature. Uh, so we have this kind of five groups. And then we, if we compare the, 
we compare the pre-survey and post-survey, especially we do a comparison uh, between the control class and the, and the expand class. So we can see certain, certain improvements. So, so on, the, on the positive views towards science, for example, they, the expand class may find this kind of assessment to be interesting. They, they want to do science more at home, at, at school. They also want to join the a science club or kind of like they want to watch the science program on TV or visit science museums or it, et cetera. So especially they want to like to become science later in the future and work as hard as, so this kind of attitude change because of this kind of uh, uh, to be catering the interest into the science uh, lessons. So uh, this is some kind of example of the artifacts. So because at the end, they need to uh, make certain artifacts to showcase their understanding. And that this group is very good at making uh, comics. So finally, they, may, they, are, they have been, been making a comic books to show the, their understanding on the on the on this kind in, in using this kind of uh, Lightman versus Duckman uh, comics to show the understanding, and uh, and uh, then they also this one this students also make a uh, a crops to make a periscope from the recycled materials. So all this kind of artifacts are a kind are, are, are can be called as interest driven or interest driven crops. Okay, and here this is uh, another example. So how the students can use the to show their their understanding of light, or or, or they have been making certain and uh, certain actually after they have made their, their artifacts, their crafts, they can present to to the to the class of their of their artifacts to to highlight their understanding, and we have found this kind of presentation has already or already very effective for them to, to consolidate the understanding. Okay, so from this study, actually we can see that uh, uh, students think what they're learning is valuable to their own interest. So this is actually, we can call it as this, we can call it as so-called a value-based interest. And, uh, and the learning can be meaningful by utilizing or by capitalizing their interest and teachers can uh, have acknowledged the preference of the students. And uh, when this kind of interest, can, because this is, we are trying to, trying to make certain transfer of the informal interest to the formal classroom. So this is one direction. Actually in our another project, we are do another way to transfer the uh, formal in, formal lessons into the informal like so LP. So the, that, that is another uh, a, a, a direction. So our assumption is that actually that interest can be used as a lever in connecting the formal and informal context. So here we can see that by capitalizing student interest can help the students to develop skills and the competencies that can be beyond the routine, routine cognitive tasks and uh, also support their ability to, to, uh, to synthesizing the information that uh, often comes from, from outside the, the formal uh, curriculum. So this study, we can see it, we can see it as a, 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 try, a, a trial, session or try a, 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 a journey that we are making this kind of formal and informal to be integrated together. And uh, we can also see that this kind of interest can also be leveraged on when the more technological components can be, can be introduced in. So that's, that's our uh, current effort. We are working on that. So, so I also hope that more people will be more interest in how to using how to utilizing interest in this kind of 
in school, uh, schools, uh, school and outer, outside of school, this kind of formal informal integration. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, um, Long Kai. Um, we have quite a few questions. I'm going to quickly go into the first one, which I thought is important. How can we identify the interests of students? How can we make sure that our pedagogical strategy or technique can tackle the interests of students? Yeah. Say a so little that, bit? Yeah. So that, that, that is definitely a very good question. So in this study, as we said, we have been utilizing this kind of questionnaire uh, to do, we do this kind of questionnaire to the students. So then we can categorize uh, this kind of five interest groups. So because that, that is to be used at the first step of this study, and uh, we, we don't think that is a very, a very um, concrete way of grouping interest groups, but that is, can be used in this study because it is quite self-reporting. And this kind of self-reporting may not be so accurate, so we have to acknowledge such a, such a, such a, maybe there's a liability of this study, but uh, we think that this, this can be used. So that's, but it is just to provide some clues for the student, for the teachers, because we also have certain, certain discussions, group, uh, group discussions, try to, try to uh, reaffirming they are in uh, interest tabs, so that's a way try to make this kind of interest uh, grouping to be more accurate. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, by and by by categorizing this kind of interest group types, so or groups, we can see that it has been very effective because they were those those students with similar interests can be working together, working together on those kind of uh, interest interest-based creation uh, activities. So with, with those similar interests, they can be, they have been working together very effectively. So that's our, our observation, yeah. Okay, thank you. There, there are more questions that is on the q and I'm just gonna quickly go to one more, and then um, I will get you to actually look at the question and try to respond in case we don't have time at the end of it. There's one question that talks about, uh, thanks for sharing your interest-based intervention. So from the teacher's per perspective, what would the teacher need in order to help design or create this interest-driven lesson for their class? I guess you, yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, because we have two teachers, we have this kind of so-called experiment teacher and the control teacher. And, uh, and uh, act actually, in, a, for the, in our own study, for the control teacher, the control teacher is actually also have been working very hard in, uh, in motivating the students. But this kind of motivating motivation of interest is the meaning from this kind of interest on the, they can show her, because that, that control teacher, I'm very impressed by her interest by like show certain items, then uh, for example, a lamp uh, in the classroom, then try to tell how the lamp will be working, right? And like we can see the students can also be, be engaged. So that's a, another way of engaging students. But our approach is more on the, this kind of personalized uh, interest. So it means that in students, so, so actually we can see that this kind of experiment teacher, they have been, they have, they have been to design more adaptive tasks according to these different interest types, right? So it means that what control class is one approach with all the class to all the students, right? And this one is like, a, well, uh, so according to this kind of five interest types, so we have five different uh, activities, interest-based activities. So in this sense, uh, teachers have also in the interview, the teacher also, uh, shared with us that uh, this kind of activities, this kind of designs actually has been more challenging for the teachers because they have to devote more time, more energy to be adapted to this kind of interest types. 
Okay, I guess there are a few more questions on DI curriculum and teachers' competency, um, which we hope to come back. But I encourage you to look at QA, Q &A, um, yeah. and A and try to type in the um, answer. Thank you so much, um, okay. Long Kai. I'm going to pass the time to Long Xiang to talk about seamless learning, and hopefully, we have a bit of time to come back as a panel. Uh, Long Xiang, I'm going to pass the time to you. And thank you so much for all the questions that's coming in. Please continue to do so. Hi, so everybody can see my slide? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hey, good afternoon, and thanks again for coming to uh, this panel. Uh, so, uh, the seamless learning, we, because um, the NIE have been doing seamless learning research for more than 10 years. Uh, I think I, uh, including me and, and as well as my colleagues, all this, I presented seamless learning in very, very, a lot of uh, uh, different occasions and uh, different emphasis and different target audience. Some of you may have heard of us, uh, but some of them maybe, some of you maybe are uh, new to this uh, notion. So what happened is I'm going to give a very quick introduction of what seamless learning is about, uh, but I'll try to put uh, more emphasis on connecting this to what new, uh, how seamless learning can inform new education normal. I'll give you some ideas of how you can, you can improve the new education normal, uh, which you are interested in at this point in time. Um, okay, the next slide. So first of all, we ask a question of where, um, where and how should learning, would learning happen or should happen or would happen? So we know that we have uh, on uh, top left, you see that this is a very traditional classroom. Even nowadays, uh, many of these classroom settings are looking Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, but this is where we can actually uh, try to get all the learning being synchronized. Or we said the learning all being, being go towards the same direction as what, what uh, the national curriculum asks you to. Um, but then the bottom part. Bottom part, this is something that about informal learning. You actually you start, everybody, whenever you are born, uh, at the moment that you are born, you are actually started your informal learning. And with all these informal learning, uh, opportunities from the time, uh, from the, I would say from the cradle to grave. And we also have this uh, top right corners, although this is actually a second life, uh, 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 the screen capture of second life, but actually I use it to represent cyberspace. You have uh, all the opportunities uh, to learn on cyberspace and uh, using different tools and different, different uh, platforms and different environments. Uh, but we have all these uh, different contexts, different spaces that provide different types of learning opportunities. They have different resources giving you. And some of these are actually quite unique. But then all these learning experience, all these learning efforts are actually quite fragmented. So we have something like we see some of the themes here. We have formal and informal learning. Yeah, this is a theme. We have uh, the themes of individual and social learning. Usually we call it collaborative, collaborative learning, but not necessarily collaborative as long as you to learn with others or even learn from others to consider social learning. And we also have something that we call it learning in digital space and learning in physical uh, reality. That with all these things there. So how about we bridge all this together? Yeah, can we actually bring up a learning trajectory that get together all this? And what happened is that yeah, you are going to bridge them and you recontextualize your learning and you make your, uh, your living environment, every single children or every single child or every single learner's uh, living environment, yeah, from school, from home, uh, elsewhere, online, all this, it becomes your personal learning environment, personal seamless learning environment. So you remove the sim or at least you blur the sim. So what happens is that we have something like, you have an opportunity to learn and then you apply, you reflect, and you learn and unlearn and relearn through recontextualization. So that's what seamless learning is about. So, it's a continuity of learning experience across different contexts and spaces, which I, I mentioned some of these. Uh, uh, used, to be, uh, um, used to be all these uh, um, different spaces and then we try to bring them together. And it's not just learning anywhere and anywhere, at any time, anywhere, but we need to reach the learning processes and outcomes. It's not just always doing the same thing at different places, but you're doing different things at different places. So ideally, in the past, we keep thinking about we need to have uh, equip all the learners, all the students, one mobile device per student, one uh, handheld per student, and they have the 24-7 use of mobile devices so that they can use different tools and, and save different, all the different data collected, all the, uh, all the things, all the student artifacts are created in the same space, same place. 
uh, that was what we actually thought of uh, the kind of uh, technological uh, uh, settings. And ultimately, we want to nurture lifelong learners. So that's essentially what we want to nurture lifelong seamless learners. So uh, I can quickly give you an example of how we actually implemented in the classroom. So about 11 years ago, we already had this, this study, which uh, we actually help uh, bring about two years worth of, uh, of uh, primary three and primary four, uh, these are uh, science curriculum into a seamless. So this is one of the um, lesson plans we have designed. So we start off, uh, we learn about, uh, we get the students to learn about plants and their parts. This is a unit about. And uh, so the students are supposed to learn what are the roots, what are the stems and what are the leaves and what are their, uh, what are their functionality and how these three are put together so that they can do this uh, water transportation or this. And, and uh, they actually, the underpinning concept to learn is about system, to learn about system. So maybe it started off in class, uh, get the students to, to, to be uh, aware of what uh, this entire topic is about and what are their learning objectives. And then, uh, uh, of course, they learn some of the basic uh, knowledge and you get some activities like students' groups, they dismantle a pen. So I relate them something like kind of a, uh, um, it's something we consider this uh, this mental plan as a kind of a, of a, a analogy to system. So relate them to plant parts, and then they take they use their phone, their personal phone, to record, and they present to the entire class uh, to explain what uh, how they make sense of uh, all these these things. And then the next thing is that out of school they get the students to feel out about the K and W fields of KWL. So this is a scaffold tools for science learning, uh, which are uh, K is about what they have learned. So which means that this is going to activate the students' uh, prior knowledge, get them identifying prior knowledge. And then they get a student to write, I wonder, which is actually learning objective setting. And they leave the L part, which is what I've learned, uh, leave it blank for the time being. So they put it in a, they save it in a phone, and then they start doing some web search to, to find out more about uh, the topic. And out of school, the students are uh, take photos and plant parts and neighborhoods and post on the blogs. And then, and that was 11 years ago, they used blogs. So uh, it means that different students, they, 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 they take photos of uh, stems of different plants and they put them in the same place. And then uh, different types of roots are put in the same place. And they make comparison, they discuss, they say why these two roots look different. Maybe they, they function differently. So they can do some web search. So this is D, our school. Students discuss and compare photos and blogs and, and, and try to create no, uh, co-create knowledge out of that. And our school, uh, Students create animations to illustrate the transport, trans, transport system about how they transport water. Uh, so this is kind of uh, make thinking visible. And also teachers show good student work, animations and can't view and invite students to comment. Um, and students create concept map and summarize the learning gains and fill out the L part, what I have learned. So they summarize what they've learned through these two activities. And teachers show good, good L and concept map and invite students to comment in the classroom. So the activity is something looks like we start off from, uh, this is a framework I proposed about in about 2013. So it starts from top left, learning engagement in classroom. Yeah. And then you go down, there's a personalized learning out of school, at home, everywhere, elsewhere. Uh, so it means that the top left and bottom left, we emphasize mobility. And then the bottom, the bottom right, well, the right part is about online social learning. They post everything online, they post experience online, and then they share, they discuss. And we go back to the top, in-class consolidation, which actually what happened is that uh, the teachers should bring together and get students to, to consolidate whatever they have learned. So the, the right-hand side, we emphasize reflection. And then you see the formal setting on the top and the informal setting on the bottom. And actually, we also encompass individual learning and social learning. So with, if you are designing your lesson plan or lesson uh, or learning journey, following this framework, but, uh, this non-linear, Okay, so it means that you'll be able to encompass all these type of different types of, uh, of uh, spaces. And there's also another key purpose of doing seamless learning. We want to make the most up of the experience within specific environments. So as I mentioned just now, in classroom, teachers are there, so they set the right objective, they, they engage in learning and make preparation of uh, subsequent activities. So that's the best part of a classroom. But then what classroom cannot do is an authentic learning. You apply whatever you learn in your, in your daily life, observe phenomenon in your daily life, and, and this is something that you have to do when you are getting home. And from there, you post it online and your discussion, uh, not during classroom session, but out of classroom. Yeah, so it means that you have a lot of time for the, the student to share their understanding, all these things, and then they can also easily search for the internet to find out more. 
uh, to aid their discussion. So learn and do the right thing at the right time, at the right place, with the right tools available. Yeah. And so this is actually uh, emphasized a lot of uh, students' self-regulation regulation and metacognitive skills and making the right judgment about what to do with what available resources or opportunities when in a particular environment. Yeah. So this is something that uh, we focus a lot on. Draw the best out of individual environment and we try to bring uh, all these learning efforts together. So I actually I invented a term called synthesize. Your learning or your lesson plan originally is not so similar, but how can we synthesize them? So we have all these different things like distance blended learning is something we are familiar with from before seamless learning. There was the distance and blended learning, there was differentiated learning, there was inquiry learning, experiential learning, situated and authentic learning, problem-based learning, scenario based learning, and MOOCs. So all these we see um, researchers and the rest of the world, even practitioners and the rest of the world, they bring all these uh, originally existing kind of uh, different learning uh, uh, approaches to go seamless. And Similar learning does, it can be seen as a meta learning approach. Under this meta learning approach, you can, you can bring to put together different types of uh, pedagogy methods. Yeah. So, scaffolding. You can scaffold seamlessly, you can co construct knowledge seamlessly, you can learn personalized learning go seamless, you can have a self regulated and directed, self directed learning can do it seamlessly. Keep classroom and learning, they can go it seamlessly. Workplace learning and also lifelong learning. We can do this seamlessly, more seamless than we know of. Yeah. So similar size. That's a demonstration of how existing learning approaches may be subsumed into the design of seamless learning journey. So that's how we see it. And also how the more generic and flexible notion of seamless learning may enrich an existing learning design. If uh, the original learning design is still what you're interested, you want to focus on. You want to focus on strict learning, that's fine. You want to focus on that learning, you want to focus on home-based learning, that's fine, but you can infuse some of the seamless learning ideas into is to enrich whatever you are, you are currently doing. Uh, so this is something like our 10 years uh, uh, long uh, research journey. We start from ideation and absorption, and then uh, the yellow color one are all those in science learning. And the blue color one are in Chinese learning, but we also have done some uh, English learning before. And also there's an in-situ knowledge building uh, white one, humanities, uh, uh, 2010, 2010. And 12. So this is an integrated communities, which actually they brought together uh, this um, um, geography, history, and even a little bit of maths, and also also social studies. And all this they put together into this institute knowledge building, which they bring the students to to all these uh, like Siloso Beach, right, like Sentosa, all this to learn about uh, history, learn about geography, all these things. So this is something that they use similar learning to design to make knowledge building uh, more seamless. <laughs> Um, so we have technological models of seamless learning started from uh, just how I mentioned learning hub. So every student they carry their own mobile phone. So this is their learning hub, yeah, personal learning hub. Yeah, they can bring it everywhere. They use different different apps to do different uh, carry out different learning activities. They save everything in the same place. Um, but then, if if let's say you are not ready to go for one to one at twenty four seven. So we can do this division of labor. So we save everything on the same social media space or the same platform, something like, let's say, uh, SLS or maybe somewhere else, and Modo or whatever. And then you can, uh, you, you, uh, at home, uh, at the school, you can always, uh, always uh, borrow uh, the desktop, laptop available in the schools so or even, even uh, those mobile devices available in the school uh, to do maybe one hour, two hours activities and return to school. But you save everything on the social media and then you go home go home and use a home computer, you, you borrow uh, your mobile phone from your family members for young kids, uh, maybe they don't own one. So they can always go back to the same social media space. Yeah, either post new things or, 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 or respond to, to friends' comments or revise whatever they, they posted or, or say. And on the go, they can always uh, borrow phones from their family members, go everywhere. So this is a, we call it division of labor. We, social media space becomes their new learning hub rather than individual phone. So this is something that we try to make it flexible or work around uh, when you don't have one-to-one. -one. Uh, so I have some reflection on seamless learning in this the current pandemic and post-pandemic new education normal. So first of all, we're, we're now MOE, uh, we keep talking about blended learning. So I try to make comparison between seamless learning and blended learning. So the entire blended learning experience, face-to-face -face or online, synchronous or asynchronous learning, they are largely prescribed by teachers, so that's what blended learning is about. But seamless learning actually privileges more open-ended, even incidental learning, and all those more social and also uh, 
in this incidental kind of interaction. So it makes it a bit more self-directed. They get a student to have a, give them some leeway for them to do whatever they want. And then they try to connect to whatever the teachers prescribe told them to do. And so that's why we believe that specific seamless learning experience designs can be subsumed into standard learning, such as in some of the home-based learning environment. That, so that's a point I want to talk about. Okay, home-based learning itself is uh, rather or more than a virtual meeting room version of classroom learning design. So I think this is also what uh, our Singapore's MOE they keep, keep uh, 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 telling the teachers. So you don't just try to simulate whatever you've done in the classroom, but you try to draw the best out. I keep talking about draw the best out, but now draw the best out of the technology mediated uh, environment. Uh, so we try to deliver, but we go to similar learning sideways, not only based on whatever home-based learning that uh, Singapore teachers have been doing. So we try to leverage resources at home. I can give some examples in the time permit later. Uh, leverage resources at home, which is something like we did, uh, I shared just now. Uh, and also, um, and the other point is that most asynchronous individual and social learning before and after HBL sessions, such as you can bring in learning, you can do some activities in between two home-based learning sessions or maybe one home-based learning and one classroom session. In between, you get students to discuss something, they post something and discuss something. So this is something that we, we don't just analyze, we don't, we don't just design and enact activities during the home-based synchronous learning session. But we can do something beyond that. I always try to connect all these uh, learning activities together. Yeah. So one-to-one, -one, another issue, because in Singapore, we know that in next year onwards, all the secondary schools that are going to uh, practice one-to-one. -one. So one to form, So we have an issue about the form factor, form factor that affects the learning designs and learning experience. So are we going to use just a small smartphone or are we going to use a tablet? So all these actually affect the design. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the form factor is small, it's, it's going to be an issue because it actually make it more mobile. The, uh, enhance the mobility, enhance the portability. So you can do something something which tablet probably difficult to do uh, and something that laptop computer cannot do. So you need to know what are the form factors and draw the best out of uh, different types of form factors and decide what is the best to give the students. Uh, yeah. So there are more recent research on learning analytics for seamless learning. Uh, so this is something that I think this is also from the research point of view is in, uh, we can look into. But for pretty traditional, we will be wait until our research outcome and then we can learn from them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Long Xiang. Um, there are a couple of questions that I would like to quickly point to you. The first yeah. question is from Zhang. He said, Long Xiang, just curious, are you aware of any literature or research on seamless learning related to teacher or adult learning? Uh, yes, I know. I, uh, it's rarer because mostly in uh, K to 12 or actually K to 16. Yeah, from primary school, secondary school up to up to tertiary level, but I know there are some, some studies on teachers. That means that, uh, uh, let's say they can bring it either for teachers or any type of vocational study, you can, vocational education, they can actually, actually try to connect their formal learning into their, let's say, the practicum, and also their social learning within the, so after they, let's say that they learn from the practicum, yeah, or maybe industrial attachment or whatever they want to call it, uh, they can always uh, can, uh, uh, post their experience uh, maybe on the, um, on, on, um, on a social media space and, and share with their, their classmates, share with their peers, and then they learn from each other. Yeah. And, and maybe help each other to solve problems with each other. I, I, if I think, think of it myself, I cannot solve, but then my friends can help me, my peers can help me to solve. So this is one way you can do it. And also adult learning is more on, more on uh, self-directed, lifelong learning. This is a, these are a couple of studies on this, yeah, but I'm not in uh, great details. Okay, thanks. There is another interesting question from Kian Hui. Um, in your research, which scene is the most challenging to bridge in Singapore classroom for the various yeah, levels of education? Maybe I'll just keep about, it short so that we can come back together. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Talking about, about, about I, I, I think it's rather than talking about Singapore classroom because I'm rather, we, are, um, uh, we, are level, we are actually advocating beyond classroom, within and beyond classroom. So I, I probably am not going to answer this in terms of within classroom, but maybe within the formal education system. Yeah. So I think the major issue is that uh, probably because uh, we are still a little bit exam driven in the past. So I mean, there are a lot of activities that the teachers are trying, still trying to make, uh, try to make it more prescriptive. And also in the learning design, activity design, I mean, some of the teachers uh, which we, I work with, uh, they have already have this, uh, this, uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, awareness that they're trying to design some activities uh, uh, maybe at home or, or up there, maybe they collect data or whatever. But even that, 
they still the teachers will try to prescribe things uh, get, make sure that the student uh, will reach the correct answer uh, the standard answers rather than uh, 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 embracing diversity of answer I think so the major scene is probably not quite on uh, those three scenes I'm talking about but more on the scenes between between learning whatever the national curriculum want you to learn and learning whatever the student interested to learn and whatever the student think think aloud tinkering and all this so this is a, another theme i'm looking at i'm trying to solve it thank you for your response i think this theme we have some more questions but later on you can respond to them but this theme yes. bring us back as a panel i would just like to bring the panel i know we are short of time but i think there's this group of um question that talks about teachers converging the learning at some, with some common expectation, you know, um, balancing student interests and the preset curriculum, and also really trying to work at this theme that you just mentioned. Um, and and th there are questions about designing curriculum and pedagogical suggestion that allow teachers to balance, whether it's across, um, I think this is uh, applicable across the three presentation. I wonder if the panel has something to, to say about curriculum design, about pedagogical suggestion that actually allow teachers to balance um, what is demanded in, in the expectation and, and in all the things that you have said. Yeah. I'm going to open up to any of the panel to, to um, respond. Long Kai, would you like to say something about all this, the balancing in terms of curriculum design and pedagogical suggestion? Because I think quite a few yeah, came up from kind your of balancing uh, is, a, is a very, I think it's a very key thing for the, for the teachers. Uh, so, because by by our own uh, this study, but this uh, this small study, so uh, I I don't want to say it's. Um, it's a very big challenge or a very small challenge for the teachers, but uh, the teachers have definitely to make some changes. So they have to be more adaptive in the instruction, in the guidance. <laughs> and uh, this kind of change is, but uh, uh, because one kind of uh, a positive uh, development is like uh, after this kind of intervention, uh, when we interviewed with the, like the HOD, right? And then, <laughs> The HOD's view is like, oh, this, this kind of approach actually from her view has been very effective and uh, she already want to sustain such, uh, such effort in the, in the later time. Even this is not a, this is not a must. <coughs> it is not a must. So what I mean is like, uh, by this kind of small changes, we can also make this kind of small changes to be sustainable. So when the teachers can see the values, when they, when they can see all oh, the, the personal interests of the students can be respected, can be uh, leveraged, and uh, can, be, uh, can, be, can be really uh, seen by the teachers and then can be seen in the final, this kind of uh, learning outcomes of that subject. And then for those, especially uh, from those kind of interest-based uh, artifacts. So the students actually have been very excited. So they think that this kind of effort has been worthy. So, I mean, this kind of, this is kind of, can, can, can be seen as a positive uh, feedback loop. So that's the, that's the thing I, I have. Okay. The rest of the panel, Kenneth and Long Xiang. Oh, um, if I understand the question uh, truly, uh, that you're trying to uh, uh, catalyze some discussion, it's um, the balance, because you keep referring to balance, the balance between uh, curriculum objectives and learning innovation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, building on what Long Kai said earlier, uh, yeah, regarding the worth, the, the, the essential worth of the intervention um, and also building on what Long Xiang talked about when he talked about... Um, uh, okay, anyway, so basically, I can't remember. So, um, yeah, got distracted by the noise. Yeah, 
the in, I think the I think one thing that com, that 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 that's a commonality between the 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 interventions that the three of us or, or the programs that the three of us are uh, represented here uh, bring is that they are not just esoteric uh, learning experiments just for the sake of uh, research and education, but they are strongly driven by our three respective uh, beliefs in in helping students have more grounded and authentic understandings of, of, of concepts in the curriculum. In other words, uh, from, from an East Asian perspective to lapse into stereotype, it's easy for many of our students to just parrot off the correct answer, the so-called correct answers, but whether or not they actually believe in them, that's why I keep talking back to values, because um, behavioral, the behavioral outcomes are not necessarily reflective of uh, disposi dispositional beliefs, um, and uh, they can be very easily mistaken by uh, by 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 someone who's as as Long Sang says by someone whose uh, uh, short term goal is exam performance. Uh, behavioral outcomes can very easily mis be mistaken for uh, for conceptual understanding, and I think something that drives the three of us with the uh, work that each of us does with our respective teachers and collaborators is that we are really trying to build towards um, um, the learners doing well because they understand and they believe and not simply because they have memorized or, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I will go through the questions, and um, I think these questions are relevant to the panel. But from Longkai, from your presentation, there's a question that says, what might be some differences in the relationship between interest and learning for older students? I think because in your case, you talk about primary school. So I would also invite the panel if you have any um, thoughts about for older students, um, about it, how interest drive them, you can also comment. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I don't quite understand why there's a major difference between interest and, uh, and learning on older or younger students. So to my assumption is like maybe as the uh, audience, this kind of question is like maybe the older, older students may have more uh, established understanding of certain certain topics. So then this kind of interest may not have a major impact on the students. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, I, 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 so, so because to me, like, like this kind of interest-driven approach is definitely should be, should be applied to, if, 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 if it is not all, but most of the age groups of uh, students. So that's my assumption. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, so that's the that's I think it because because that like because now it's like definitely because interest means choice, right? It really means personal choice. So then in this study, we are trying to say that when the personal choice, personal interest can be can be utilized and uh, explicitly, and then if they have the to, to be formed into those kind in, in a mechanism of interest groups, so then it could be an effective way in promoting learning. So that's, that's the way. So even in our uh, research uh, research world, we also have all those interest groups. Uh, so I think it can also apply to this younger groups of students. So, so I don't know why it cannot be applied to those so-called older students. <laughs> so that's my response. Yeah, thank you. Anything else to that? If not, I will bring up a question on seamless learning, Long Xiang. Um, what would be some aspect that a teacher would have to consider to do the right thing at the right time, at the right place, and with the right tool, so as to achieve an effective seamless learning experience? So the question was actually asked by my, my former collaborator. <laughs> yeah, she actually had, uh, because uh, in our past project, we actually have uh, have uh, these uh, five uh, five design principles we propose. Yeah, so I think these design principles are actually giving some of the ideas of how 
teachers can make use of uh, of uh, different. Uh, uh, we also give examples of under each uh, design principle, so that the teacher, let's say, for example, there's one of them. One of them is talking about leveraging informal uh, environment, uh, in, informal resource, and it's resources in terms of informal environment. We raise some of the examples, like your family members, your your whatever objects you have at home, and whatever uh, uh, opportunities for, for for kids to go out, uh, go outside either with parents or, or, or other things. All these, there are always are opportunities for students to learn. So the main thing is that they, they need to create the student's awareness, their awareness of that. Okay, uh, you go out, you don't just play play or, or unless teacher tell you to do this, you don't do this. You, ne you never think of doing this. But then what, what happens is that, okay, whatever you learn in the classroom, this is something that, uh, and then you encounter your daily life. This is actually relevant. So why don't you, Maybe even you take a photo and then you just write down whatever you think that this is relevant to my course or whatever teacher told you. Uh, it's not the same as what I observed. And then you share the classmate. So actually, it's more important to, to create a student's awareness. But maybe you need to start off with uh, all the designs that get a student to, to, to make use of the objects available, resources available. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that the student, once the student know that, then in the future, they have this kind of a meta connection, they have this kind of a self regulation, they know when to do this. So, one example I raised in actually you know, in our past project was that uh, there was design on, uh, on primary four uh, science where the students are supposed to learn about, about um, uh, what are the light sources and non light sources. Yeah. So, they get students to go home to take photos of all types of light sources and non light sources. Like, say, for example, they can take torch light, they can take the Maybe the stove, yeah, you open, uh, you, uh, you uh, switch on the stove and then maybe the lights. And even you can take, you can even, even a sun, uh, the sun outside your window, all these are considered as light sources uh, or TV, television. But there's also another case, like say, for example, they take a photo of a, a mirror and they say this is light source, but actually it's not, it's just reflecting light by, it's not a light source itself. So if a student actually posts this and says this is a light source, then this is actually a misconception. So maybe, their colleagues, uh, their friends, they can come up and, and try to correct them and then they can discuss. So maybe you get some activities to get students to, to have this kind of awareness that I, I should try to find opportunities. Even the teacher didn't tell me, I can identify by myself. And the future, the student can do that by themselves. Yeah, so this is something that we want to have this kind of supporting environment that the students share whatever they're interested to share without teacher telling them that this is relevant to the course, you do, do that, not relevant, don't bother. Yeah, so this is something, uh, uh, I think from teachers, this is from a higher level point of view, rather than uh, just telling teachers, uh, these are things you can do, these are things, because there are too many possibilities which uh, teachers are probably not aware of. But the students need to find, identify by themselves. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, there, there are two questions. One asked for, I, I know uh, Long Kai type in a response. One asked for, data on motivation, motivation level. I think that's more interest-based learning. The other, there's a question, are you able to share some key positive results with me? I suppose uh, it could be across our research. I wonder if this question is posed to you, uh, would you have any specific pieces of um, um, research um, data or result that you would like to use this platform to, to share? Yeah. yeah. So actually, we definitely we have some certain uh, positive uh, results in terms of this kind of motivation, or in terms of this kind of result. Uh, the, also, the pre and post <coughs> results, because we 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 especially about the pre and post re, uh, results, because we have seen that the improvements, uh, especially for the five groups, right? So we have witnessed that to the from the pre test and post test. We have seen the seen the increase from the pre and post test, especially on the uh, group group three and group four, the sports group and uh, and the arts group, right? So that the the the, the, uh, the uh, improvement has been very significant, and then also if we compare the uh, control control class and the experiment class, the, the actually the both the control class and the uh, experiment class has experienced significant increase, but the, in, the, 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 uh, the experiment, experiment class actually in, increased better or, uh, or more than the uh, control class. So that's, that's from the, our data. So that, that will be, so we, we have just uh, submitted the, uh, the, the, the paper, uh, so we will see the results. Uh, you see whether this kind of results can be, uh, this paper can be uh, 
uh, accepted. Uh, so yeah, so but uh, I think from today's uh, discussion, uh, the we we also have the, this question on the so-called uh, design principles. I think that's a that's a very important question. So definitely, it's like uh, it's really how. Uh, so that that that's something we also also need. We, actually, we have we have a uh, certain points in the in the paper, but may not be so complete. So, but uh, that part is uh, really about the Q and the core or uh, core take we can from this uh, this study. Yeah, how how to, how to design the lessons and how how what are the kind kind of guidelines can be can be helpful for the teachers to design and enact such such lessons so i think that's the really about the the key uh, the key things that we need to summarize in, the, in our study thank you Kenneth and long xiang were there anything add to add for positive um, research result no if not, there is one question i think Sorry, yeah, Miss. Okay, there's one question. I, I think you can share it. Um, so this question read like this: While these researchers uh point towards uh we point towards a certain positive outcome in more innovative pedagogy, can I NIE include them in the student teacher curriculum through the modeling by lecturer tutors as well as getting the student teachers to design such learning experience? I think this is um, a broader question, but maybe from your own experience, you are teaching in different courses. You can share how we have how you have been integrating your research into your teaching your practices in in NIE. Um, just anyone, but Kenneth does a lot of IoT work. Maybe you can also share. Um, so just very quickly, so that I don't take up too much time for Long Xiang and Long Kai. Uh, we have time. Uh, we have um, my my. Um, so over the years, uh, my team has had the privilege of working with uh, uh, what uh, student um, beginning teachers on MOE's teaching scholar program, and uh, we've been we've had um, teaching scholars from mathematics, uh, from geography, and from history so far. So in mathematics, as uh, Julie uh, suggested, uh, our work was with. Uh, um, the teaching scholar and uh, local schools uh, with respect to the internet of things um, in, in uh, um, again in again in data literacy building data literacy among the students um, for history I've had a couple of uh, scholars so far one I worked with was uh, we collaborated on an augmented reality project in history education. And um, I also have a geography teaching scholar with whom uh, I'm working with the Sobe project in geography. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Long Xiang, anything you want to add? For um, well, my own teaching, I'm actually uh, trying to integrate different types of, uh, of uh, pedagogical approaches. Uh, but if, uh, is there any seamless learning uh, notions or, or design that actually inspired me to, to kind of uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, if, if, uh, they try to put some of the ideas into into my design. I think it's more on uh, if they ask me to to think of now. I think uh, that's one thing I'm, I'm doing uh, because I for almost every single lessons um, I'm currently I'm teaching more master courses. Uh, for for almost every single course uh, I, I I'm, I'm teaching. What happens is that I'm I'm getting students. Uh, I'm, I'm setting up I um, um, online forum, yeah, or maybe it's a social media space. For the students, I told the students that uh, uh, whatever you think, you know, maybe you read a uh, newspaper, you read you, you read whatever uh, online uh, writings or, or your own experience, uh, which you think it might be relevant to the course you are teaching. Then you always post it, share with others, and give your own comments on it. Uh, either they will try to uh, explicitly connecting with whatever I taught, or maybe maybe other lessons, other other courses, other modules that they are, they are learning. Yeah, not necessarily restricted to mine. Yeah. So or if they don't, I'll try to make the connection with, for them. So that in the future they know they how to make the connection. So I even want to try to break uh, the silos of the subjects. Yeah. So that so that uh, 
even let's say there's another lecturer who, who actually teach something that is actually kind of contradict with what I'm teaching. Maybe uh, I will, we have different views on theories. I welcome them to, to bring in and discuss. Yeah, so these are things that, so I'll try to break the silo. So that's the main idea I, I, I've been doing. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, we have been always, you know, to try to integrate our research into our own practice as well. And those are great examples that you have mentioned. Um, we have a couple more minutes. There's this question in the chat that says, um, specific to, to interest base, but I think differentiated instruction is in the mind of many of us, as practitioner as well as researcher. I'm gonna read out first, in Tom Linson's DI approach, we should differentiate learning element, content process, et cetera, according to students' readiness, interest, and learning profile. Can you comment on how your study relates to DI? And I think I see a little, a, a, some part of DI in, in the presentation. So I'm going to pass to Long Kai first, then maybe Long Xiang can talk a little bit about seamless learning um, to DI as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think to be, uh, I, I think this kind of interest driven learning can be part of the differentiate instruction, right? So to my understanding, so it's really, we want to 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 cater the cater to the needs of the students. It can be interest, and it can be other kind of preferences, whatever uh, this kind of lead. So so different types of uh, leads So I think that's why I think because one liability that I need to admit that this kind of interest the determination of this kind of interest types may not be so accurate, right? So because it is based on a survey, based on a questionnaire. Yeah? So that's why I think that's the part where the AI can can make can, can, can really play a role in this kind of so-called uh, accuracy. Yeah? How to accurately capturing this kind of student data so then we can put the teaching and instruction to be more adaptable to the needs the types uh, of the students, I think that will be a major uh, challenging for us to do to deal with maybe in the next, uh, I don't know, decades, I don't know. So, it, it, so it's really about uh, how, to, how can we capture this kind of data to <laughs> accurately, then we can make more adaptive uh, recommendations or more accurate actions to address the needs of the students. Yeah. Okay. Kenneth and Long Xiang, anything on DI that you want to comment? Uh, I'll say something and then Long Xiang can have the last word. Okay. Long Xiang, do you mind? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so for, uh, specifically for Sorbet, uh, Sorbet basically is just an environment for learners to interact with each other just as they would in uh, their everyday lives. And uh, my work resonates very much with Long Xiang's emphasis on uh, helping teachers and students see value in their everyday interactions. Um, very often this, this value in everyday interactions is not uh, foregrounded in the formal curriculum uh, to the detriment of learning. Um, so, you know, Long Seng and I have been coming uh, to this uh, problem from, from various angles over the many years that we've been working. Um, for Sobe, basically, um, at, if it were enacted in a prime, at, a, at the primary level, uh, there need not necessarily be any um, uh, uh, discuss. I mean, the dialogic half could not, need not necessarily be in terms of mathematics, but simply in terms of helping them tell stories about what they were doing, why they were doing, and um, uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 in terms of differentiation between academic ability, uh, a stronger academic class would. Uh, would need less scaffolding uh, and a uh, greater degree of self-directors could be given to them. Uh, um, a class coming from the point of view of readiness, which is lower, uh, would, would and the teachers have already designed these, would, uh, uh, would um, be taken through a series of structured activities so as, to, so as to help them be comfortable with and explore the environment. And um, so therefore, I've tried to talk in terms of differentiation, in terms of uh, age cohort, in terms of readiness level and academic ability. Yeah, Long Xiang, I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, 
at least from from uh, what we have done in the past 10 years, we didn't really uh, exactly directly or explicitly look into a DI. In fact, there's an interesting point about seeing this. I, I haven't read uh, 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 enough details about this, but then, you know, there's a difference between differentiated instruction and differentiated learning. Uh, what I'm trying to make sense are based on uh, uh, the face value about these two terms is probably differentiated learning probably focus more on the teacher, uh, students on more personalized learning. While differentiated instruction is everything prescribed by teachers that different groups, different core teachers, they, uh, students, they, they do different different works. So I think from uh, similar learning, at least from our design point of view, we're a little bit more uh, focusing a little bit more on uh, getting students to do what they really want to do. So in a sense, it's a bit a bit overlapping with interest-driven learning, but at the same time, uh, uh, as what uh, we have trying to, I mean, we are also some of the current studies or future studies that are looking into seamless learning for self-regulation, uh, also meta-connection. Meta-connection means that the ability for you to, to, to uh, uh, select whatever, what's the best thing to do at different parts of things. This is uh, what the students, they have to have this kind of uh, uh, skills. Now, to identify the learning abilities to use the right tools rather than teachers always telling them. So this is a, this is a way of, uh, of trying to trying to create this kind of a different type of differentiated learning rather than teachers design everything. But they get the students, individual students to be able to, to draw the best out of their unique environment resources yeah, to, to uh, support their learning. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and that's really, um, it kind of ends at an encouraging note on what we can do um, as we face with the new education landscape. And I myself, as I work with the teachers throughout the lockdown, the post lockdown, when you're navigating online and, and in school, um, the teachers has been tremendous in, in, in being creative and innovative to, to uh, face all the challenges. And I'm quite sure what we hear today from Long Xiang, Long Kai and Kenneth has really um, planted new ideas in our mind. Um, I've talked to them several times, but every time I, I, I hear them talk, there are new ideas and new ways that I can look at um, teaching and learning. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for staying with us throughout this Friday on, on a Friday afternoon. I'm going to end um, the webinar soon, but before we end, your feedback is important to us. So there is a QR code here. So if you can scan it, and for those questions that we haven't been able to address, we will key in and we will um, respond to you if you have left your name accordingly. I think we have cleared almost um, all the questions. So please um, use the QR code and um, give us some feedback. And also, I would just like to use this one last minute. If today you found it to be a productive um, time spent with us, our research scientists, we have one more session coming out on 16th of October um, with Peter, myself, and Elizabeth. We'll talk about the part two, how we look at um, the different aspect, and this will also include teachers' um, professional development as we look at learning technology in school amid and beyond the pandemic, looking at our new education normal. So with this note, thank you every mu uh, very much for our three panelists, for our back-end work, Vivian, Gina, and Joan, and for all of you for staying with us throughout this Friday afternoon. And have a great weekend ahead, and we will say bye-bye for now. <laughs>